D&D Beyond now fits in the palm of your hand with the free D&D Beyond app. It's the perfect tool set for beginners, regular players, and seasoned dungeon masters. Play faster with the guided character creator and access your character sheets, spells, and abilities wherever you go. All of your adventures and source books are at your fingertips, even when you're offline. Easily find and access the rules you need when you need them. With more features to come, download the free D&D Beyond app today. Welcome back to D&D Beyond. I am so excited because we have another incredible interview today with one of the people who made the book that I, you know, am very in love with, Ben Richton's Guide to Ravenloft. We are here today talking to the, a senior designer for Wizards of the Coast and one of the writers of Ben Richton's Guide to Ravenloft. Please welcome Amanda Hammond. Hi, everybody. I am so happy to be here and thank you so much for inviting me, Amy. <laughs> I'm I'm honestly thrilled. I think the audience is aware that I am just getting to live out my dreams of being like, there's a new D&D book out and I just get to ask people questions about it. Okay, let's do this. Uh <laughs> You're just going crazy with all the interview questions and all the people and like the world is your oyster, my friend. <laughs> like how much time do you have? Like 10 hours? Like 15 hours? Is that about... <laughs> Can I just have you all week? Can we just have you camp in front of your computer and talk about things? <laughs> Yes! Uh, sleep away Zoom camp for just talking about D&D stuff. We're starting it right now. Uh, but oh, I do have to pick and choose because I guess I probably don't really get 15 hours to do this. So you were responsible for several distinct sections of Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft, and I can't wait to dig into them. First of all, we're going to get today to some domain spotlights, which I'm very, very excited about. But first, I want to ask about one of the really cool things in Chapter 2 of Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft, which is... With all these guidelines about making your own domains and adding your own elements, uh, Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft contains sections devoted to specific subgenres of horror. And I thought that was such an interesting choice. And I was really impressed by the way those came together, by a ton of the choices inside them, by how practical they are, by how interesting they are, uh, how easy you all made it look <laughs> to distill the stuff down. And I know you worked on a couple of those. So can you tell us first in general about working on one of the subgenres of horror sections? Absolutely, yes. So I worked on the ghost stories uh, subgenre and the gothic horror subgenre. And uh, so I know that Wes, the lead of the book, Wes Schneider, was very interested in the nuances of what makes those subgenres uh, really recognizable and what uh, defines those subgenres as the types of stories that they are. And so he really did a lot of deep diving into the horror genre uh, across literature, across film, across tabletop, uh, storytelling in general, and came up with what he thought, uh, you know, were the definitions of the um, very distinct uh, subgenres. And so then that became the outline, that became the different subgenres that you see in chapter two of Van Richten's. And then he uh, looked at the, the writers that he wanted to work with and thought, okay, who would be good at these specific subgenres? Who knows a lot about these subgenres? And Wes, uh, who has, uh, spoiler for later in the interview, known me for over a decade at this point, uh, went, oh my gosh, that massive nerd Amanda has got leather bound books uh, of Gothic horror literature from largely the 19th century, as well as ghost stories, also from the 19th century. Authors like M.R. James for ghost stories, uh, Bram Stoker, Mary Shelley, uh, the Bronte sisters, all over um, these specific subgenres. She is the person who can recite some of that stuff by heart. She should write those subgenres. And I went, yes, please, hallelujah. Finally, my dreams have come true and I got to write them. <laughs> Oh, that's fantastic! I would like to request a separate library tour at some point. Excuse me, leather-bound tomes. <laughs> yes, I have an entire bookshelf in my my living room, actually, in my lounge that is sitting there right next to DVDs that's all leather-bound uh, hardcovers uh, of period literature primarily. There's a bunch of Poe as well, so there's some American writers, but yeah. <laughs> that's fantastic! Okay, so let's talk about the first of those sections. Let's talk ghost stories. What essentially, what's a ghost story? So a ghost story is a story with a ghost. <laughs> oh, that's not a good enough answer? Oh, okay. we're done. <laughs> 
So ghost stories uh, are, are, yes, they are stories with ghosts in them, but there's a lot of hallmarks of ghost stories that uh, will really become familiar to a lot of uh, viewers, a lot of consumers who uh, are versed in the, in the horror genre, or maybe even not. Ghost stories often have to do uh, with uh, a very personal story that uh, involves an individual. So oftentimes there is a ghost or a haunting that's at the central um, point of a ghost story. And the story is all about people in the present day and whether the present day is actual present day or the present day for that piece of fiction, uh, it might be a period piece. It's all about them encountering what has happened uh, to the person or the thing that is representing the ghost and uncovering that story and really learning about the ramifications of these things that have created the ghost. And uh, un oftentimes it's some terrible tragedy uh, or some really overarching sin or some really, uh, really heavy thing that has happened that has created this ghost that has disrupted the normal cycle of birth and death to create this haunting at, the, at a place. And it's represented all throughout literature, lots of different films uh, are ghost stories. And it's really about that kind of personal discovery of what has happened to that that person or the thing who's become the ghost uh, and then kind of the reckoning with what does that mean and how do we maybe put them to rest or how do we escape the presence uh, if they're malevolent or whatever. There are a lot of tinges that then get into other subgenres like, uh, you know, a, a lot of um, ghost stories end up becoming kind of like possession stories if there's a supernatural element or, uh, you know, if there's like hell involved or something like that, they get into lots of other things, but that's sort of the basics. So they, they have the sense of there's always some history behind it that I guess it hadn't occurred to me till reading this section sort of does make them unique that like there there must be backstory for there to be ghosts. Um, the, the two come yes. together uh, and then some mystery and then some kind of resolution. I love the section of that you need some kind of agency in order to encounter and deal with a ghost story. Uh, yeah. how, did, how do you approach expressing genres in terms of tables with game design elements? Yeah, so uh, a lot of times you'll see uh, within the subgenre section, there are specific elements that are very core to the tabletop gaming experience that you can use to express these subgenres. So things like overarching plot, we've got a random table of plots that are very steeped in these subgenres, in the ghost story subgenre or the gothic horror subgenre, um, in my case. Um, there are villains, right? So we're describing what type of villain you might see in a ghost story or what type of villain you might see in a gothic horror story. Uh, we are also uh, providing like location options, um, settings for where a ghost story takes place. All of these things are what provide that feel for the ghost story. Um, but uh, so tabletop, like including all of that in there and then putting the PCs within that element uh, that sometimes could be randomized or that might, you know, DMs might get a really good idea from reading that table of things that they like. That's going to make that start out feeling like a ghost story as opposed to, oh, this is just a tabletop game and then things happen and we inch you toward it feeling like it. it's a very good way for it to start out feeling that way from the very beginning. So baking in those choices can help so that you're not sort of like regular adventure, regular adventure. Now there is a ghost. I hope it will feel appropriate. Yeah, exactly. And because I really feel like that that gives the DM uh, a much tighter grip on the reins of a horror story. And that is very important when you're running horror at the tabletop, which is the DM sort of uh, always kind of having in mind what it is they're trying to evoke. And if you are just starting out without having considered in what ways you want to evoke that subgenre, and then you introduce a ghost, you run the risk of, oh, the table thinks this is hilarious. So now they've turned it into um, a comedy routine and that's great and they're having fun, but maybe you as the DM, that's not really what experience you're wanting to create. So it's really helpful in avoiding that from the beginning. So you can steer towards the thing you want, which if you want goofy comedy, you can set that from the outset. But if that is not uh, your plan, <laughs> I can that can be sort of a distressing turn of events. What yeah, advice you have? Absolutely. Yeah. What what advice you have for DMs who are wanting to use ghost story elements in their games? Sure. Um. So I would read over that section and really pay attention to, uh, again, how tightly tuned the adventure can be, how tightly tuned those elements can be to evoke that from the very beginning. So, for example, location is really important in a ghost story. It's often confined to um, one specific area. There's a haunted house, for example. There's a haunted ship. Uh, there's a, a little village, but you don't ever, tra you know, um, traverse outside of the village. 
uh, all of that is important. And so you're using the environment to evoke what the haunting is doing before the players are actually discovering the haunting itself. So, you know, the doors uh, slam when there's nobody in the room. That's a sign of the haunting. Uh, there's, uh, you know, mounted up swords in the sort of Victorian style uh, in a lounge, and then they just happen to fall down, and that's part of the haunting. Uh, there are screams, or there's a phrase that's shouted that you hear in your, in your mind's eye that nobody else can hear, and it's connected to what has happened to the ghost or something like that. Uh, that's all part of the ghost story. Those are those are things I would encourage DMs to pay attention to. Um, even if you are just like stream of conscious, I want to run a ghost story, sit down with some notes and just write out the bullet points of things that will happen in the game. And it might not even be the plot, but it might be just these are creepy things that I want to happen that will then point back to what I think my story is going to be. You know, I want the PCs to discover that the ghost uh, you know, was a murdered nobleman, uh, you know, who was killed by a jealous brother, or I want my PCs to know uh, that this was about like a mass death that happened and then the family covered it up on uh, on the house grounds or something like that. Those little things are really going to help the PCs feel creeped out and feel as if they're experiencing this living, breathing, dynamic world. Uh, without actually revealing what's happening until later, because pacing is also very important in a horror game as well. Oh, I love that. Uh, how would you suggest, if you have any quick advice on how do you pace out something when there's a mystery at its heart? Any quick tips on that? Yeah, absolutely. So I would start with that kernel of what the mystery is. What has actually happened? And what is it that the PCs are going to discover? And it should probably just be like an elevator pitch. The PCs are going to discover that the nobleman was murdered by his brother and this is why the, ha the haunting is happening. So start with that and then come up with little little lists of, of things that are clues that the PCs might find, breadcrumbs that you can put into the environment or uh, something that's said, uh, a book that's found in the library that has got pages of the nobleman's diary tucked into it because, you know, generations ago when this happened, uh, one of the servants who was helping the brother uh, was hiding that part of his diary, something like that, like all these little breadcrumbs that make the PCs go, oh my gosh, there's something deeper happening here than the dinner party that we've been invited to. Uh, or, you know, there's something more going on besides, oh, there's um, a miscreant who's causing mishaps at this mansion and we're, you know, we're, fig we're figuring it out. Um, all of those little clues and do not reveal what's actually happening until the climax um, of the adventure, until there's some kind of encounter some sort of uh, fight, uh, you want to build in what is uh, called in literature a, den a denouement, right? You want that to happen, and then you want some falling action, and then that's where you end the story, because otherwise then it does not feel as if it is a confined horror experience. That's fabulous. Uh, I would love to talk about the second of the subgenre sections that you worked on, uh, or our yeah. second for our purposes today. And it sounds as if this is one that goes throughout Ravenloft, that goes throughout the history of Ravenloft, and that probably fills a lot of that bookshelf you were talking about. Can you tell us a little bit about gothic horror? So gothic horror is a very distinct genre, right? Um, it has captured the imaginations of people for generations and has started primarily uh, in the uh, the late 19th century, the mid 18th, uh, in mid 19th century. And it's all about novels such as Bram Stoker's Dracula, uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein or the modern Prometheus, Oscar Wilde's um, writing is, is very gothic. There are, are lots of uh, women gothic writers out there like Emily Bronte and Charlotte Bronte who included elements of gothic horror. And gothic horror is very much about, uh, in the uh, evocation of that time period, uh, it's very much about like the veneer of, of beauty and, uh, you know, nobility in some cases and 
uh, you know, the the class, uh, the evocation of, um, you know, a very classy type of situation, whatever the story is. And it's about the rot that's underneath that story. On the surface, everything is beautiful. There are characters, you know, who are very respected, who are very interested, who are very motivated to sort of like better themselves or, um, you know, keep whatever it is that is going on with their family going. And then there's something underneath that's uh, that's really nasty that is then revealed in very small pieces until it becomes very clear what exactly is happening. In Bram Stoker's Dracula, of course, we have letters written from the perspective of Jonathan Harker, who is sent uh, as a solicitor uh, to this count who has a very good reputation and he's very rich and he stays in the castle and all these strange things start happening and he doesn't really understand what's going on and he attributes it to the fact that well the count is from a different culture in a different country so i'm just trying to you know um, blend in and it turns out that the count is a vampire and uh, has got his sights set on going to london and terrorizing the population right so so gothic horror is very much about like that sense of dread and all of the rot and decay that is underneath the veneer of, of beauty and a perfect society, which does, you know, of course, doesn't exist. It's all about explaining um, what's going on underneath the surface. And that's really what I kind of find fascinating about it. And I think it's relevant even today. Um, and, you know, the critiques that it makes of society are relevant today. And, you know, of course, there are pitfalls and things like that that we can now be more aware of. Uh, that they were not necessarily aware of in some of those earlier texts. I mean, for, first of all, I, I love Bram Stoker's Dracula, but it is amazing to sort of be like, the vision of what you're afraid of in women is very much goals now, so we can find new <laughs> things. Uh, uh... Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. We can look at that now and go like, oh, there's a real problematic element to, oh, we're afraid of foreigners and we're afraid of women. And, you know, anybody who steps out of line is scary. We know that that's ridiculous, right? Um, but taking the way that that sort of evokes that terror can be really kind of interesting and turning it on its head. And there's really, really uh, awesome things being done within the genre by women and people of color and people who are taking those things and making them their own and doing very interesting things from a modern perspective. And I think that that's really got the staying power. And that's really where, you know, that interest lies for me. And and we can still we can do that while still loving all of the many, many things that that book does well and the plays and the that's movies fair. and the many versions of it. What makes it different in a game? How do you bring Gothic Horror into your game? And how can this section help us with that? Yeah, so the section talks a lot about the same things, um, the same types of elements of the tabletop game that I mentioned before, uh, setting, um, uh, villains, uh, plots, and and all of those things, and they're very they're very gothic, and they they do take those very core foundational elements that were set out uh, in some of those early writings, and then expanded upon in later years uh, about ways to really create that tapestry uh, of everything being beautiful and perfect on the surface, and it, provide hints of the decay that's underneath it. And it's kind of similar to ghost stories discusses in that section, how Gothic horror is often, uh, you know, is, is very personal for the characters experiencing it. And the characters really uh, reckon with this terrible um, external force and they have got to, uh, you know, look within themselves to figure out how do I have the metal? How am I able to work with my friends? How am I able to overcome this? terrible horror that is facing me that is almost insurmountable in some cases especially in those works right um so we really provide a lot of options for that and there are uh, early in the gothic horror section there are bullet points that talk about like here are ways that you um you know help your pcs feel like they're playing through a gothic horror story including for example uh giving them a lot of agency uh, figuring out what makes them heroic, figuring out what they uh, maybe are afraid of, and sort of having those elements come out of the gothic horror story as part of the plot can make things feel very gothic as if you're experiencing it, you know, as a player character yourself. And I love uh, the, the the bullet points I find tremendously helpful in the Gothic Horrors. And also both uh, both of these sections have lists of suggested monsters, which I am personally planning to pillage when I need to be yes, like, what yes. does fit into this setting? And you've organized them by challenge rating, which is awesome. Uh, yes. But I love things. Uh, Gothic heroes are often virtuous, deeply passionate, or courageous. Find ways for adventurers to test characters' beliefs and morality. 
it's simple advice, but it's great because you can go through each of the sections and figure out, like you could probably figure out which kind of game you wanted to run just by reading through these sections. You Do you have really any more could. DM advice yeah. for Gothic Horror? I'm sorry? Do you have any more DM advice for Gothic Horror? Well, I really like that you mentioned, uh, you know, that to Gothic Horror PCs are often very virtuous and pure and good hearted and finding ways to test their morals are important. And I do think that that is a really key part of Gothic Horror and has been from the very beginning. Right. So I feel like uh, during a session zero in which, you know, you should be talking to your players about what kind of horror story is going to be run and what they are not OK with and, you know, getting all on the same page there. I feel like a session zero for a Gothic Horror game will also include those questions. What do your PCs feel strongly about? Who are they as people? What are they willing to do to protect their friends? What are they not willing to do to protect their friends? Would they rather take on a terrible force um, and potentially a personal injury to themselves rather than their friends and family getting hurt? Or are they survivalists? Those types of questions I think are really interesting because you can note the answers to them. And then as part of creating your Gothic horror plot, if you're running homebrew, you can actually put those challenges in front of the PCs where they go, oh my gosh, you know, um, this character, my character felt like that they, you know, would never kill anybody that they don't know isn't irredeemably evil. And yet now they're being confronted with all of these things at once. And now they've got to figure out, are they going to fight back? Or are they just going to run away? And, you know, that's a very simplistic example, but it's a way for players to go, oh my gosh, I never thought this was going to come up, but you can keep that in mind as a DM and you can use it against them. <laughs> <laughs> so mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's talk uh, let's talk about one of the the best and most famous I think of the gothic horror settings. It, you can't talk about Ravenloft without talking about this. It goes along with the history, but we have a beautiful new version of it that I am in love with. Can you tell us please about Barovia? <laughs> I was going to be like, let's say it together, Barovia, yay! <laughs> yes, Barovia is, of course, you know, uh, almost a, a Ravenloft defining domain, right? It's one the one that probably everybody would know about if they know about Ravenloft, because uh, Count Strahd von Zarevich lives in Barovia, and Curse of Strahd takes place there, and, uh, you know, many modules um, from uh, all the way back to second edition take place in Barovia. So yes, it was uh, a bit daunting, and absolutely a dream to be able to work on Barovia, this uh, very important domain to Ravenloft itself. And uh, yeah, I did lots and lots of research. I read everything that had been written about Barovia and Curse of Strahd, but also in previous editions of modules and publications about Barovia, and uh, really just sort of got my head into what is this domain like? Uh, you know, how is Strahd motivated? What is what is it like living under the shadow of this completely authoritarian uh, dictator who's also a vampire and unliving, and he's the entire reason everybody is trapped in Barovia? And you know, uh, you probably see that in the section. There is absolutely iterations on. Strahd knows he's trapped. Uh, adventurers are going to find out that he's trapped. Uh, that could es essentially become a plot element for adventures in Barovia, especially post Curse of Strahd adventures. They could turn into Strahd has realized how strong these uh, these player characters are, or or other player characters. If it's a new party, they, he's realized how potentially worthy they are, and now instead of trying to destroy him he is wanting them to take his place so that he can then escape. And if you can imagine a uh, all of the realms out there with an unleashed Strahd von Zarevich is a bad day for everyone. <laughs> yep, it's a, that is a, a bad recipe. Uh, Absolutely. I, uh, working with Barovia, you have both the oldest and the newest Ravenloft material that sort of uh, relates to Strahd. Uh, so how did you choose or how, what was the process like of figuring out, we want to bring this in, we'd like to try something different with this? What were sort of the, the keystones there? Absolutely, yeah. So for Strahd himself, there's a lot of information about Strahd's castle and there's a lot of information about 
Strahd's background, and you absolutely get that um, in the uh, the Ravenloft write up that we did about Barovia, and we were very clear sort of about the events that led to Strahd becoming the first vampire in the multiverse, and the fact you know uh, that he kills his brother and he drinks his brother's blood in the Amber Temple, and then, then the dark powers grant him uh, both this blessing and this curse of him becoming a vampire, but also becoming trapped as the Dark Lord of Barovia. All of that is in there. Uh, there's a level of detail, I think, that um, will be unique to, to this book. And one of the main things that I really, really wanted to get right was the characterization of Strahd. Who was he as a person in life? And spoilers, he was not a nice guy at all. And who is he in Undeath? And who does he become uh, with unlimited amount of time? And it was very important for me for him to not be a redeemable villain. He is a monster. He's a manipulator. He's an abuser. And that is all about, that's how Barovia becomes this realm of dread and horror, this hateful place, right? That the villagers are, you know, cowed underneath the shadow of him. And I really kind of struggled to make sure that I got that right, um, just because, you know, that's a very dark place for one's head to go when you realize, oh, think of the worst person maybe you've ever met in your life and what would it be like if they became immortal? So I ended up consulting with another writer um, who uh, worked with me on this particular part of the project uh, named Alexander Sandgrom, who is the director of operations over at Cobalt Press, a place that I, you know, I worked for a little while before coming to, to Wizards. And he and I sort of batted back and forth about like, okay, well, what would he do? Uh, how would he act? And what ways would the villagers be terrified of him? And I think that that really kind of comes through in the in the writing of the section. So that was a very important thing to get right when working on this, uh, you know, very storied land of Barovia for me. Excellent. Uh, what were the, the challenges of expressing the story world while focusing in on game design options and really practical, usable stuff? This is for all the domains, but this is my first chance to ask someone. So how do you do it? Oh, yeah. No, that's a really good question. And honestly, like, it's a struggle, right? When you only have so many pages to express what the domain is like, and you have to give people tools for running games here, because that's, you know, the whole point of the book. So there's a, a very sort of efficiently brief, and it's not even really brief, it's a few pages, but there's an efficiently brief section that is essentially a gazetteer of Barovia that lays out all of these different individual places and what you can find there and a little bit of a hint of their backgrounds or how they tie into other places. Uh, for example, we do have the Ember Temple, which is a place that I mentioned that you can go and it's implied to be um, a very high CR adventure area which is, again, another good place that you can go post Curse of Strahd to sort of serve that goal of this section, allowing DMs to easily create a sort of, uh, you know, DLC for Curse of Strahd adventure if they want to <laughs> do that for their PCs. <laughs> if you want some DLC, <laughs> check out Van Ricken's <laughs> Guide. Um, but yeah, so we, you know, we were very like brief and efficient about describing those places. Uh, there are other places that uh, discuss the, the various uh, there's a Were Raven uh, group that's within Barovia that is discussed there. Um, there uh, uh, is an abbey that has got some interesting things going on that don't necessarily have to do with Strahd, um, but are things that you can discover and pull out of Barovia to make it uh, feel more like a living, sort of breathing place as your players are discovering what's there. They realize, oh, it's not just big scary vampire times, hide from him until we're ready to fight him and then we're done. We really wanted Barovia to be much more complex than that and that's the goal of that section. So then we wrote all of that and then we got to the tables that you uh, likely have read through and it's all about various ways that you can bring your PCs into a plot threads that involve Barovia. And one of the main elements of Barovia is Tatiana, right? Tatiana, uh, who uh, Strahd, you know, uh, just saw as an object and, you know, abused and felt like he was in her and she was not having that and she jumped, you know, out of the castle as he has tried to, to claim her and disappears, right? Nobody knows where she is. She is somewhere within the mists and uh, we don't know if she's trapped. We don't know if she escaped she might be reincarnated. And there is a table that discusses what the reincarnations of Tatiana within Ravenloft might be. And there's some really cool, fun options in there, I think, for that. And that's one I of my specifically, favorite things. That's, yeah. I, I'm <laughs> specifically obsessed with that table uh, or, or preoccupied by it because it's it's so 
tantalizingly full of neat ideas and connections to other domains. And uh, yes. was that sort of a, how does that, the, the philosophy of the book and sort of giving people these paths that they could follow so that it's different for each person while making sure that it would still be rich and stand alone. Was that like mm -hmm. the project at the outset or something specific to Barovia? Um, I would say that that was the entire project. I would say that Ravenloft is somewhat of a challenge to do a book about because all of the domains can be just uh, individual. They can be unique and they can have nothing to do with each other. And, you know, there is some somewhat of an incentive for DMs to have a story within a realm and have it just take place there. And then your story is done and that's it. But we really wanted there to be some sort of uh, cross interactions with those domains so that if you are wanting to do a more extended Ravenloft campaign with story arcs, you could absolutely do that. Now, I kind of hate to think of the horrors that a group of PCs would have um, encountered if they're going from domain to domain and all of these things just keep happening. But you could turn that on its head, right? You could provide agency to the PCs. If you are wanting to run an extended Ravenloft campaign, you can have them have knowledge of what domains are out there. And there could be a reason uh, that they could then jump from domain to domain to domain because perhaps they're looking for something or they're looking for someone. Hello, Tatiana. Uh, and they are needing to go to these different places. And we really wanted to provide tools for the DMs who are interested in that sort of thing. Do you have any more advice for folks who want to run this version of a run into the possibilities you've laid out here for Barovia, either before or after Curse of Strahd? Oh, gosh, yeah. So uh, one of the fun things about Barovia, and this is one of the fun things about all of the, the Ravenloft domains, but specifically Barovia with it being uh, very... I would say in line with a uh, sort of high fantasy, it's got, uh, you know, there's no like real anachronisms the way there might be from going from Forgotten Realms to another domain that has got like a higher level of technology or things happening that don't exist in the realms. It's very easy to, for example, uh, the DM shall remain nameless, but it rhymes with Schmesh Schmeider, Wesley, <laughs> ran a game in which we thought we were starting out. Uh, in uh, Icewind Dale, and we thought we were going to be playing through Rhyme with Frostmaiden, and we end up uh, going out into this snowstorm, and there are these yetis, and we're hiding from them, and we're these little gnomes, and we're just like, oh my gosh, there's no way we can fight this. We're just going to kind of like wait until this passes, and then the snow starts blowing down thickly upon us, and we can't see, and it's complete whiteout conditions, and then all of a sudden, the storm clears, and it turns out that it's mist and then we walk and we start oh i guess we see some trees and we're not sure where we are because there's a snowstorm and we just ran and then the mist falls down and we just see a sign that says welcome to barovia <laughs> <laughs> so uh that is a very fun way that you can absolutely do that in the middle of almost any campaign, if you want and think it's appropriate, you could have something like that happen that's disorienting, uh, that makes the players fall back on their heels, and then all of a sudden they've been pulled into Barovia for a reason. Perhaps Strahd has done it, perhaps they have accidentally done it through something that they've got, some item that they've got, or a person who's with them, and then there's a little story arc that kicks off within Barovia, and they have to, to navigate that. And that, to me, is really interesting, and I actually really loved that. I just like to give Wes crap. <laughs> <laughs> that is fabulous, and it definitely yeah. highlights the, the, the missed travels and the, like, the sort of unpredictability and uncontrollability to that is one of my favorite things about uh, Van Rex's Guide to Ravenloft and Ravenloft in general. Uh, yes. So I love to hear that that's exactly how it would play out in a game. Ugh. I would Are love to talk. Well, yeah, a little, a little. You find <laughs> you know, welcome to Barovia. Everybody's population going down as we speak. Uh, population, <laughs> you. Good luck. <laughs> I love that one of my favorite like one-off things in this book is the part where it's like nobody thinks it's a good idea to live in the village uh, near the, the castle in Barovia. They just that's how things are. It's such a perfect yep. distillation. It's the idea.